that most of my career has been spent in a middle school band room. And uh, I, I champion beginning band in middle school and, and think it's, it's one of the trickiest and most difficult things to teach, especially seventh graders, but that's, that's a whole other conversation <laughs> for a different time. Um, and I, you know, these two people, uh, Chip and Teresa, in my mind, are the two best middle school band directors in the country. Um, Teresa is from Lexington, Kentucky. Actually, she's from Winchester, went to George Rogers Clark High School. But um, Teresa has been my mentor ever since I taught band camp for her at Henry Clay High School in 1997. And I always tell everyone I, I meet that Teresa is the best teacher I know. And um, I owe a lot of my success as an educator to Teresa just by sitting in her band room when I was in college or even as a teacher, I would go down and say, hey, can I come let you come, come watch you rehearse today? And, and she is absolutely incredible and is inspirational and just recently retired. Not that I'm gonna age you, Teresa, but, <laughs> uh, but, but her band played at Midwest. I thought, what, Teresa, 2005, is that yep. right? Yeah, and, and at Beaumont Middle School in Lexington, one of the best Midwest performances of a middle school band I've ever heard. And uh, she's amazing. Chip, um, you know, is from Chicago, and, and Chip, if, if you all haven't checked out the McCracken Middle School Band website, go check it out, because there is so much research and repertoire and stuff, um, presentations that Chip has given, uh, whether it at, be at Illinois conferences or Midwest, um, and his bands are great. He's played, he's taken his kids to Midwest twice. And, uh, you know, between these two people, um, they are the real deal in terms of middle school band. And uh, I, I want to encourage you, um, one of the smartest things I ever did as a young teacher when I started in 2000 was I, I went to some of the best middle school band rooms in the country and just sat and absorbed for a couple of days to see how they interact with kids, to see how they teach, how their programs are set up, the infrastructure, all of those other things. And between these two people, you know, I've talked to Chip from a distance over the years and, and we've become friends um, the last four or five years. Um, you know, they are just such a wealth of knowledge. So how I wanna to approach today, um, I've had several uh, middle school band directors in Arkansas submit questions um, that I, and we're just gonna go through and, and Chip and Teresa, whatever direction this takes us in is perfectly fine. It's just kind of an open conversation for you to share your philosophy and, and what you think and how uh, you approach things. And then I have some questions for students um, as well that we'll get to towards the end. So the first question I'm gonna ask, and this comes from a teacher that has taught for 12 years. And, and this question, we always get asked from college kids, you know, what advice do you have for a first year teacher? Well, this question comes from a teacher that's been teaching 12 years. And the question is this, what advice do you have for a teacher or a band director, middle school band director, going into the middle of their career? Whoever wants to start. I'll go first. I, I think um, going, going into the middle of the career is a, is a, is a lot like going into the beginning. You, when you go into the beginning, you're, we're all excited. We all just can't wait to get in front of the band that, that we always hoped we'd have. And at 12 years, it should be getting close to moving toward that band you always wished you had as a first year teacher. So uh, continuing to learn, uh, continuing to go to everything possible and continuing to be a sponge. I mean, even down to the very end and even now, uh, just sitting and listening to music and, 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 and continuing to learn. I think if you go to clinics and you, and you attend Midwest and you do all the things that your state conference, you find things that, that continue to make you excited. And I think especially in middle school, that excitement has got to be primo. Uh, yeah, and you, I mean, you've got to walk into to that, that classroom every day with the understanding that you know, this is the first day for many of those kids. It may be your 12th year, but it's their first or second or third. And you've got to treat it as such. So. Yeah, the, the kids are going to reflect you. And so if, if you don't have that enthusiasm, they're not going to have that enthusiasm either. 
Um, I, I, I thought this was actually all the questions you sent Jim, I thought were super interesting. I thought this one was super interesting too, especially since we don't know the context of the question. Um, cause for me, I like around that time, I actually kind of went through like a mid -ish year, like career midlife crisis. <laughs> Well, Chip, Chip, let me ask you too, and you can, and I think I know where you're going with this a little, but my follow-up question is going to be burnout. So if yeah. you want to, if you want to go in that direction too. And I, and I don't know if mine was burnout or, or what, I mean, it might've been, I might still be going through it. I don't know. Certainly after the last few months, I'm burnt out. Um, but, you know, a lot of what I was dealing with was just wondering if there was, you know, that age old qu qu question of like, what's the value in what we do? And and I would literally have kids so excited about coming to rehearsal and I didn't necessarily feel that same excitement anymore. And I wasn't quite sure why I wasn't quite sure that what I was preaching to everybody as the value of what we did was really there. And, uh, and it was right around that time. It was right around kind of the mid career type thing where I kind of started to kind of have the, maybe that hump. And it, it could have very well been burnout because I've been going up, it feels like a million miles an hour for a really, really long time. Um, but I, I, I think one of the, the not so obvious things I'd recommend kind of mid-career is to make sure that you're con constantly, constantly testing your assumptions. Um, and for me, I, you know, the way we were taught when we were students growing up is not necessarily the right way to teach something. And we can't assume that just because we've done it for the first half of our career a certain way that it's the right way to do it. Um, and, and going along with, with, with continuing to learn stuff is, is you have to test those assumptions. Um, whether you see something in a clinic, whether you read something in a book, if, if, if it's somebody you respect giving advice, even if, even if it goes 100% against what you believe in, you have to at least at a minimum try it and test it out to see if there's value in what they said. And a couple, I, a couple examples I'll give um, is when, when teaching tone is you'll hear a lot, of, a lot of instruction in terms of having the kids open their throat. And that's just, that's an old style thing. That's the way we were taught when we were growing up. And I, it's not really possible to actually open up the throat. And I, and I think when you say that to kids, what you could actually be doing is causing them to do things that would otherwise they wouldn't do. So they could do some weird things inside their mouth. They could do some weird things with their jaw because they're trying to open their throat, which they can't actually do. So you gotta be careful with some of that stuff. Another thing was uh, reading a chapter in a tuba book by Patrick Sheridan talking about what uh, talking about feet flat on the floor. And as a middle school band director, I'm like, your feet are flat on the floor no matter what. Um, but if the kids' legs are long enough that their knees are above their hips, you actually can't breathe. And that's something you can test out right now at home on your couch and you can just sit in a way where your knees are above, get your knees above your hips and try to take a deep breath. You cannot do it. And so realizing that some of your, your more lanky seventh and eighth graders that are tucking their, knee, their feet underneath their chair and not putting their feet on flat on the floor are actually doing it, not necessarily because they're trying to be disrespectful or being, going against what you're saying. They're actually just trying to breathe and by getting their knees a little bit below their hips. Um, and I, I don't know, when I read that, it was like three years ago. And I was like, what the heck? And it's like, I sat down in my kitchen, I checked, I checked it out and I'm like, God, darn it. And I, could, I just could not believe. But that was one of my assumptions. And I think just kind of like, just constantly testing those things out. And just, just because we, we necessarily just 100% believe that it's true, it doesn't necessarily mean that it is true. Yeah, so let me, let me follow up with this. Um, so when I was teaching in North Kentucky, one of the, the blessings that I had was having the Cincinnati Symphony right across the river. And it was so easy for me to get a palate cleansing of, okay, this is what a characteristic tone is supposed to sound like, especially when you're sitting in front of a middle school band all day, just to get that sound in your head. Teresa, I know for the past 15, 20 years, almost every concert I go to, I see you there. So will both of you talk a little bit about, um, you know, how that keeps you reduced or the importance of, you know, Teresa, you touched on a little bit about going to conferences and going to concerts. Can both of you talk about that a little bit? Well, and I'll talk about something else back to the burnout thing. Uh, I don't think I, I can honestly say, I don't think I ever, ever experienced that. I've never throughout, and it's 
It was almost four years. I never experienced a time where I was like, I don't enjoy teaching. And, and that's, and I think that's pretty cool. But I also look back, I, I was at a lot of schools. I've been through a lot of schools in my career. Um, and, and so I think depending on, on where you get your program to, you know, sometimes we need a change and that change for me might've been a new position. And, and looking back on the career, I think that probably helped me because that re-energized me and allowed me to start over and try new things that I'd learned in the previous school and continue to move forward. Honestly, the longest place I was anywhere was at Beaumont and that was 15 years. But at the same time, I was working with high schools and, and elementaries there. So, you know, I, I tell everybody I get bored easy. So I just got to keep, keep moving and, uh, and, uh, and, and keep challenging myself. And so at 12 years, you might, I don't know what that background is, if whether or not you've been there all 12 years. I have such great respect for folks that are able to start in one position and stay there through the entire career and, and retire from the same place because that in and of itself is a challenge. Um, so it's a challenge to build a new program every time, but it's also a challenge to maintain one. And for me, I found building them was easier than maintaining them. Sure. And, and so maybe I took the easy way out, but it kept me motivated uh, the whole way. And, uh, you know, I, I, I just kept, kept doing it. But as far as concerts, uh, you know, I live, I live right here in Lexington. So I'm fortunate enough to have a lot of opportunities uh, with the Lexington Philharmonic or with the many, many ensembles at the University of Kentucky. And, and I have several students that I've taught throughout the years that, our students in those ensembles. So yeah, I still go to a lot of concerts. And, and you know, we never get so old that we can't still feel those goosebumps. And we gotta remember, that's why, we, that's why we wanted to be a part of music. And so I think as a teacher, it's really important for us to not forget what brought us to this profession. And we need to continue to give that to our students. Uh, you know, I would have, I would have my middle school band, I'd give them extra credit just for going to the concerts at UK. And I would turn around on any given concert and there would be 15 or 20 kids there that are in the seventh and eighth grade. And I'm like, wow, this is pretty cool. Yep. And so, it, and in fact, it turned, it, it, it paid dividends back to my program as well. Sure. Chip, you got a lot of resources in Chicago. Yeah, and it's embarrassing what, that I'm not taking advantage of them. I'm listening to what you guys are saying. I'm like, oh, crap, I'm going to have to admit that I don't do as much as I should. Um, and yeah, with, with obviously with Chicago right downtown and Northwestern, not that far away, and, and the, the, the opportunity to attend stuff. Um, the excuse I'm going to use is that I have four kids. Um, and uh, they're right at the age. Our, our oldest is just, just graduated high school and our youngest is going into eighth grade. So there we got them in pretty tight too. So the last 18 years have been a bit of a blur. Um, but so as much as I can, my, my oldest is a musician and is, is going into music next year. And so we've, we've attended a lot of things together. Um, but um, I think, I do think it's important at the same time, I've often at the end of the day needed to not listen to music and needed to kind of to kind of have that part of my brain turned off at least for a little bit. Um, and so, yeah, yeah I, I, embarrass, I embarrassingly don't take advantage of those resources that Chicago offers as much as I should. I mean, I, I, I think that we all go through that too. I mean, after a, a day of work, sometimes you get home and you just, you gotta get away from it. So you can be reduced the next day. I get that 100%. So um, the next question, and I, this can go in 8 million different ways. So I'm going to leave it open ended to where you all want to go. A lot of times when I go um, to middle school bands, a lot of the questions that I get asked is, you know, how my band, um, where I've been in the past, or how you all's band, how, how do you get students by the eighth grade level to play upper level literature, like, you know, grade three and a half, grade four pieces, easy grade fours. Um, I, I kind of call this the murky grade two area where um, it's, it's hard sometimes for people to get bands through that. And, and I have my philosophies on how we do that, um, teaching technique and musicality and those sort of things. But I want you two to talk about it. How, how do you navigate, you know, getting past that ceiling, you know, we, getting them through seventh grade into eighth grade where they're performing at a high level? 
Yeah, this is another just fascinating question. And again, not knowing who's asking it and not knowing the specifics of everybody's situation, because obviously everybody's situation um, is different. Um, but as I think about the way it was phrased in the, the list of questions we were giving is how do you, how do you get kids past that grade two hump? Um, and my feeling is, is the issue isn't necessarily an eighth grade issue. If, if, that's where, if that's where the kids are topping out at, at eighth grade, the, the deficiency is probably happening at earlier years of instruction, um, either, either possibly going back to the, the beginner year and most likely going back to the, the beginner year. Um, certainly, um, one of the things that's really important is making sure your ensemble has the instrumentation capable of playing music at that grade three and a half and grade four level. You can make a grade two piece sound great with an incomplete instrumentation, with maybe not a completely full low brass section or not a full low woodwind section, a grade two piece typically, especially if it's by one of the major publishers is going to work still and you're gonna be able to get characteristic sounds. However, if you start delving into the, the stuff that's written for more mature ensembles, an incomplete instrumentation is gonna be really, really difficult to get to sound, um, to sound great um, without some massive rewriting that'll probably change the character of the work. Um, uh, my other two gut, gut feeling thoughts are one is you kind of want to get a running start at it. Um, if it is like a definitive wall that you, your kids seem to have um, trouble breaking through is you'd want to start the year going easier than grade two and, and um, get a running start to break through that wall. Um, and, also, and also just kind of terrible analogy is, is the cooking of a lobster theory is where you put the lobster in cold water and you turn on the heat and the lobster doesn't even know that it's being boiled alive. Um, and same with the kids, you just start easier and gradually get harder and harder and harder. And they don't necessarily even realize that they're improving at the rate they're improving because they're doing so, so gradually. Um, and then I think sometimes we put, we put the roadblocks we put in front of our kids um, are these roadblocks we, we put them in front of our kids. We, we kind of have the, that, that mentality that there's a wall there. And I think if we take it away from our own perception, sometimes the kids will, uh, the kids will reflect that and they won't think it's hard. I mean, they're not going to know it's hard until you tell them it's hard anyway. Yeah, Teresa, and, and for you to follow up, you and I have done a couple clinics where we talk about um, not putting music in front of kids that they don't have the technique to play. And I know you're going to talk about Oh, that. yeah. Yeah, yeah. you led me right to it. So, um, yeah, so, so my philosophy, and, and Chip, you can, you can bounce back here too. As a sixth grader or a beginner, you know, if, if you were to look at my rehearsals, at my rehearsal time, I think I spend 80%. Now, this takes a lot of uh, creativity, but 80% of the time is on fundamentals. And then 20% maybe be music. And that's probably even a little high. You know, one of the coolest things that I can remember one day, I had, I had sixth graders. I remember it like it was yesterday. I had a, a group of sixth graders that had just, they had just begun. It's actually uh, like, I guess it was probably November. And we had been doing fundamentals all along. And I picked out a piece of music that I knew that they could sight read from top to bottom. And you guys that do middle school, you know, when you first get that, that piece of music and, and it's like from top to bottom, it's like a whole page, you know, it's like, man, we, we're not going to stop. And, and I made sure that, that the piece of music I put in front of them, that they had all the rhythmic tools, all the quality, tone quality, all the reading. And we at the, it was like 10 minutes before the bell and we got up this piece of music, Cardiff Castle. And we, we put it on the stand and they, I said, okay, let's turn it over. And, and I said, now we know all of these notes and we know all these rhythms and do you have any questions? And their little eyes were so, I mean, they were just like jumping. I mean, the reason we do what we do. And we started at the top and we went all the way to the bottom and those kids were on fire. They, we didn't stop, they, but I made sure that I tailored that piece of music to our fundamentals. And I think a lot of mistakes come from when we like, oh, I really like that piece of music. Let's read it tomorrow. And then you realize, well, you haven't taught them everything that's in there. So make sure, especially in the young age, that, that they have success. What would have really put a damper on that whole process is if, you know, I had to stop at every letter number or every rehearsal 
bar to regroup. We didn't have to do that. And I mean, the kids were high five each other outdoor. It was it was an incredible experience. But I think at that level, you've got to put most of your rehearsal time into fundamentals. I think by the time you get to seventh uh, seventh grade, it's probably for me 75, 25, you know, and that's still making fundamentals fun. I mean, uh, Jim, the, the, the book that we use to do that clinic, we can actually take that strictly technique book of Jim Swearingen, little bitty skinny book. It's like $5 a book. And we can have the most fun with that. And, and that, that I use with my eighth grade. But, um, you know, once I get to eighth grade, I kind of go 50-50. I'm still doing, I figure if I can send my middle school kids to high school, knowing four sharps and four flats. And I used to make them know all 12 major scales, but you know, four, four sharps, four flats going into high school. I don't think there's too many high school directors out there that would balk at that. And uh, you know, obviously the first thing when you, when, when Chip talked about instrumentation, you know, I, I start French horns. That's another one of the questions I, I had one year I had in fifth grade band. Uh, Cause we did that in Fayette County. We do that. Uh, according to the school, like I'll go to the school. Well, I had enough French horns that made their own class. I started six French horns in one year. And so I just made them into their own class. And once they got into uh, sixth grade, I brought in a French horn player that came in once a week to keep them excited. And uh, I mean, we could play whatever we wanted as far as, as four French horn parts in a, in a piece of music. So, you know, I think bringing in teachers of your deficiencies uh, is, is, is epic. You need to do that. But um, the bottom the bottom line falls with us. If we can teach it, they can do it. If we can't teach it, we can't expect them to do it. And I think that's another time that we we kind of get a little off track. Absolutely. So this leads me into to perfectly into the next question. Um, a, a lot of questions I've had over the years is, you know, if we're not in a big city center where we maybe have an assistant director or a couple assistants or people that can come in. Question I get a lot is, how do you have quality in middle school doing it by yourself? I'll start with that. <laughs> uh, I, I, my first job was uh, in a town of 3000. I was, I was Mr. Music, I was Miss Music, I was everything music. Um, and how I did it, is that I learned the first two method books of every instrument. So that if my tone on trombone was the only tone that they heard that week or that month, it was going to be a good one. And so I think a lot of that falls on us as teachers uh, not to sleep through the method classes in, at the university level and to go above and beyond what the requirements are, because there will be a time that you will have to pick up a clarinet if you're a trumpet player and go, nope, I need you to do side key F sharp there. And why? So I think, I think that's huge in it. Chip? Yeah, I, I don't see being by yourself as a negative. I, no. I, was, I was the only band director at McCracken for, from 96, I started fall 96, and we hired a part-time assistant uh, fall of 2008. So when we made Midwest in 2006, I was by myself. I was the only band director at McCracken with about 200 students in the program at that point. Um, and the reason I say it's not a negative is because there's nobody else to blame. I mean, if there's no feeder, there's no, you're not giving your kids to somebody else. Everything that those kids were capable of doing and everything those kids were not capable of doing were my, was my fault. Um, and so I, I certainly don't, know, we actually have two full-time band directors at McCracken now. I, I certainly don't want to go back to the time when I was by myself, but um, at the time, especially as a young teacher, it was probably the best thing for me in terms of just throwing me into the fire and trying to figure out how to get out of it um, and myself. But I, I think besides knowing your stuff, it, it's, it's, it's just kind of having a, a relentless work ethic and, and really just not making any excuses. I mean, it, it, it ultimately all falls on us anyway. Um, and when we're the only ones there, it's, that's, really, that's really magnified, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So the next question um, comes from a teacher who has instrument classes, they're grouped by instruments. So there's like flute class, clarinet class, trumpet class, and they do that in sixth grade. And then in seventh grade, 
um, they put all those individuals, individual classes together. And so then they start, um, she, she or he, not to single anyone out, struggles a little bit in the beginning on how to really get the ensemble going and those ensemble techniques. Um, the question was for you two, and, I, and, and actually I don't know if you two have either taught in that way with individual classes and you put them together, but what tips or strategies you might have in terms of developing the ensemble playing after a year of those classes going into year two? Uh, my situation is not structured like this, so I can only guess as to what I would do. Um, but the thing I would do is I wouldn't wait till their second year to start teaching those ensemble skills. I would start teaching them in their like instrument classes um, because there's nothing, there's nothing that you would teach in the full ensemble um, that, you wouldn't, that you couldn't directly teach um, in those like instrument classes as well. And, and it may even just be as simple as teaching them the material that you're going to use when they get to the full ensemble. So if you know you're going to do this specific exercise when they're in their second year to work on articulation or to work on balance or to work on blend, whatever that happen, that the skill happens to be, you can, teach that, you can teach them that material in advance. And then that way, when you have them in the full ensemble, you're not teaching them new material and trying to teach them an additional skill on top of it. You're only trying to teach them the skill. They don't have to, they don't have to worry about the technique or the, the, the notes or the rhythms. They can really focus in on the listening and, and that aspect of the skill that they need um, while you're doing the full ensemble. Sure, but, um, no. Sorry, go ahead, Chip. No, I was just going to say, I mean, we, we, our, our program structured, our, so we start in fourth grade, believe it or not. Um, and I see, the, I see the kids in really small groups, groups of three or four and like instruments um, once a week. And then we see them after school as a full band once a week. And this is often what we do. I mean, most of what we do in the full rehearsal at that point is redo just review mm -hmm. from what we did in the small group, um, doing the same material, doing the same skills, just with everybody. Yeah. Yeah. I think the only thing that would be really tough to, to teach is balance, um, balance within like the full ensemble sound and trying to de de develop the timbre you want. That would be harder to do with a like instrument, but you can still at least teach the concepts, I think, even if you can't practice them until they're all together. Well, yeah. there are there are so many uh, there are so many method books now, like ensembles th with uh, that are that are just for younger players. That even in like instruments, because I I did fifth grade and we just did it by like instruments. And I would bring in, you know, once they once they had a, a few basic skills and a few basic notes, I would write. Uh, I, we would play some of these uh, like quartets or trios, uh, ensembles um, from Accent on Achievement, for example. They have books that have three parts that are perfectly suited to beginner players. So you can even t start to teach the ensemble skills right there by with balancing and asking for more of the low notes or more of the low sounds. And that way they start to learn a little bit at that, at that level too. Yeah, great. So kind of a fun question. Tell us who your favorite middle school band composers are. Oh. Well, so what? This is the hard question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, a lot of people make make fun of, make fun of it, but I still I still think that Jim Swearington does a great job. You know, he he uh, it's 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 almost like a, you know, ABA. But everybody gets the melody. Everybody gets to play a fun part. You can teach. It's, it's got a slow introduction, and then the the section comes back at the end. So it's easy, you know. Once they get to that point, it's easy to play from there to the end. And it's just he's got a lot of stuff, and it is kind of textbook. But uh, he does a good job of doing that. So uh, and and I, I'm still a big fan of his Strictly Technique book. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I know since this is uh, Arkansas Tech, I got to start with Francis McBath and Randall Standridge. So we'll throw those out there right off the bat. Um, but also, uh, for me, I, Douglas Akey, when I read the question, the first one that pops to, to my mind is Doug Akey. I really like his stuff. He's a middle school band director. Um, and much like the swear engine stuff, like if you, if you have a performance in, a, if you get called to do a performance in a week, and you need something that's just, you're gonna put it in front of the kids and you know it's going to work and you're not gonna fight any battles um, with the piece itself. Um, I'm going to Bob Sheldon, Jim Swearingen, uh, Douglas Hakey. 
those, those composers because I know the piece is just going to work. Um, I'm a pretty big fan of a lot of Brian Balmage's stuff too, especially his really easy stuff, his grade point five, his grade one stuff. I think is just so well written for those younger, for those younger age levels. Yeah, I think Pierre Laplante is another really. Uh, yeah, good. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So go on in a completely other direction. Tubas, double reeds, French That's horns. Cool. Do you start them as beginners? What's your philosophy on that? There's a lot of conversation uh, between my middle school band director friends and former students on, do we start them, switch them, what? Tell us your philosophy on those. I start them all. Um, and we start, and again, we start in fourth grade. So uh, the only instrument we don't necessarily always start is bassoon. Um, and I can't actually think of a time that I've started a fourth grade bassoonist, although I have switched to Kit halfway through their fourth grade year um, when her hands were big enough. So she wanted to start, we waited until her hands were big enough and then we switched. Um, most of the time on bassoon, I'm switching them either between their fourth and fifth grade year or sometime during their fifth grade year if they're interested in doing it. Um, but all the other instruments, I mean, we, we have three quarter size tubas and in the hands of a fourth grader, they look like full size tubas, but uh, it's, it's working okay for us. Yeah. Yep. For, for me, uh, in, in fifth grade, uh, when I was traveling around and I was doing it by like instruments, I, I just, uh, I didn't start tubas because there weren't the instruments for them. Uh, French horns were sometimes I would start them, but I like to start them in pairs. I don't like to start anything just like be the only oboe or the only French horn. I think that's really tough on the kids. So, you know, my suggestion there is if you're going to start them, you know, at least have two of them. But now really, you know, again, it's so important you as a teacher are able to model that sound on oboe or French horn because um, that one oboe can tear the whole program apart if it's not done well. And so you need to make sure that you're, you're demonstrating that. Uh, to the very best. But yeah, I think the sooner you get them started, a lot of them, uh, I would wait till they came into my sixth grade band to, to, to make that switch. Uh, because then they were playing every day instead of once a week. And so I would give them a, a pretty good start in fifth grade as far as uh, uh, if it was a, a horn player, I might have started them on trumpet and then switched them. But again, it's because once I got them to middle school, I saw them every day. So in the same vein, and this is something I didn't put on your question sheet, but can you talk to us a little bit about how you started percussion? Um, some people just start them on bell kits. Some don't start them as beginners and make them learn something else and switch them later. Can you talk us through how you approach that? Uh, well, again, uh, in the fifth grade, if I, if I had, I would, I would start them in a class if I had that many, but uh, most of the time I would really not want to start I would I would not want to start too many percussionists if any in my fifth grade because I was only seeing them once a week and there's a lot that can go wrong in once a week or um, as far as as far as percussion I mean you know there's not enough daily practice so I would ask them to start on a wind instrument and they would usually rent that for a for a uh, for a year and then I would I, w I could kind of pick my hand, pick my percussionist then, you know, instead of anybody that wants to play drums, you know, I could pick my percussionist as they moved into my middle school. So um, based on how hard they were working as a clarinet player or a trumpet player or a trombone player. And uh, that pretty much worked well for me. And then when I moved them into uh, middle school, uh, generally I, I had my sixth grade split in brass and woodwinds and I would put my woodwinds and my percussion together because that I found over time, they were much more likely to create better technique because the woodwinds were working on a lot more of that, whereas the brass were working on sustaining notes and lip slurs and things like that. So I, I, you know, I had more success pairing them with the woodwinds and then they keep their practice pad right next to the bell kit so that we could work on that as well. Sure, Chip. Yeah, so uh, we do start percussionists, and I've, I've over the, the last 25 years, I've tried every possible combination of bells and drums. Um, and what we've settled on, we use um, the Mark Wessel's fresh approach to snare drum mm -hmm. and fresh approach to mallet percussion. So they, they're working out of a different method book than the wind instruments are using. Um, and so what I found works for us is I start them on snare um, and we go all the way. There's a graduation test after the first five lessons. 
Um, and then once we get to that, we can usually get through the next few assignments in, in a very short amount of time. So I will then start them on bells and mallets. Um, and then we'll be able to spend over a 30 minute lesson, we'll be able to spend five to 10 minutes on their snare assignment, which is pretty much on cruise control by that point, and then spend the bulk of our time on the mallet stuff, which is still pretty easy because they're just beginners at mallets. Um, but we can really make sure they're developing good habits and especially note reading habits um, early on uh, as mallet players. So that's what's worked for us. I've tried starting on bells and then going to snare. I've tried starting both at the same time. I've tried um, this past year, actually, we were just about to start mallets. I think they had one lesson on mallets before our school shut down. Um, so I didn't, I didn't do mallets over remote learning. I didn't want to, just didn't want to deal with it. We just dug into snare twice as hard, um, and we'll make up that time, hopefully, <laughs> next year. Although, well, I guess we'll start that remotely um, if, uh, if we don't start in person. Yeah. So a different direction. This, this next question comes from a veteran teacher. Um, that was, that was, and I've never had this conversation with either of you about this question. So I'm not really sure what you think. Um, this teacher is struggling with if, if he wants to go back and get a national board certification or, or go back to school and, and maybe resign from his position and go back and get a master's. Um, what, what, are, I, I know this is open-ended and not really knowing the situation, but this teacher wanted to know your thoughts on, you know, getting a national board certification. Should we be doing that as band directors? Or, um, do you find more value maybe in going back and getting a master's? And I'll kind of let you take those questions wherever you want to go with them. I, uh, I actually had a master's before my very first year of teaching. So, so I, I went straight through and, and had, had a rank one. Uh, at that time. So the national board for me, uh, I started looking at it close, close to the end of my career. And I just looked at it for getting to be better, you know, and, and, and I think depending on you, where you are in your career, um, is whether or not you should do it. I mean, if you're getting close to the end and you're still, or, or as we talked earlier, you know, you just got to, you got to find something else to be excited about. You know, National Board, the folks that have done that have told me that, that they have learned so much about the way they teach. And so for that, um, for that reason only, if I had, you know, if I had eight to 10 years left, I'd most certainly be doing it because, or even 12, you know, because that might be the extra thing that could, could change your teaching enough to, to get you more engaged and, and become a better teacher uh, throughout it. Um, for me, it got to where it was almost at the very end. And, and um, so I, I didn't do it, but I, I would think it would be the friends of mine that have done it said that it really has opened their eyes to how they teach. Sure. Um, like Teresa, I got my master's right after my undergrad too. My undergrad was my undergrad was actually in trombone performance and I didn't decide to switch to music ed until I was almost finished with that degree. So I went ahead and finished it and then got my master's in music ed. Um, and I, boy, I, I don't know much about the Na national board certification. I've never considered doing it. I don't know enough really. I probably shouldn't even give an opinion on it. Um, if, if I were deciding, I've got 10 years left, nine, 10, somewhere in there. Um, it would need to be a significant financial impact for me to go through that work. I think um, it would be more of a, a salary decision than me than a knowledge decision. Um, uh, and in terms of getting a master's, <clears throat> I think it just kind of depends what you want to do with that master's uh, at, 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 at this point. And you can certainly get a master's nowadays without having to resign your position. Um, I know that's a lot of work and it's your summers and, and, and it's not easy. Um, but I, it both is certainly possible. And then again, I just think it depends on what, what you are looking for. Cause I'm, it, especially nowadays, anything that you would want to learn, um, first of all, that masters of music education, there's not a lot of music in those, in those music education degrees at the master's level. It's a lot of research. It's a lot of, if that's the degree you're getting, um, I think a conducting a wind conducting degree would be significantly different. I think there's probably a lot of music in that. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm at the age that I'm not looking to jump through those hoops anymore. And, uh, and if there's something I need to know, I just go out and, and ask people and visit classrooms and make phone calls and text friends. I think what you're saying, Chip, is that we're getting old. I think that's- I, I am definitely old, yep. 
<laughs> I feel it. I feel okay, it. Okay, children. <laughs> Okay, so those, uh, those are sort of the big questions from band directors. My, um, some students have asked questions and, and they, they kind of wrote in paragraph form, so these questions are a little longer. But I, but I think they're really interesting. Um, the first question is, when you inherit a band program that isn't up to your expectations, so you know that that program should be in a healthier state, how do you approach that? And, and the other part specifically of that question is, how do you learn and understand which music will push them too much to the point that they're going to cry and just melt down, kids? Um, and this person said that he's heard directors say that you just know uh, what, what level of, of music to pick for students, but, but this, this student is looking for a much more in-depth answer. I know that's a big question, um, so go with it. I think if they can... Uh... My, my, my true test has always been if we can sight read it with limited stops and starts, then that's, that's, that's a pretty close level to be going at. If you've got a piece of music that you really want to play and you pass it out and they crash and burn and it's not even to letter A yet, it's too hard, and you sh should you try to finish it? No, you. The, if if you're a young teacher and you can't look at the score and go, oh, we're not going to be able to do this, then you know if they can't sight read it with minimum stops, then it's too hard, and you need to you need to adjust accordingly. Uh, that's 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 one way that I would figure that out. The other way is just you know going back to learning all the instruments. Can you play the trumpet part? You know, sit down. Can you play through the trumpet part? Can you play through the clarinet part? Uh, you know, what kind of what kind of uh, technique problems are going to be there so that you you know that now? Have you taught that to your kids? You know, a lot of us want to do music, but our kids just aren't there yet. So you know, you have to re revert back to their successes. Make sure they're that you're giving them something they can succeed at, and then move it. You know, move the expectations higher and higher. Teresa, let me, let me ask you this question this way. Um, I remember in 2005, I walked into your middle school band room and you were warming up your Midwest band and I walked in right as you started and the first thing I heard, and this is when I, my jaw hit the floor and, and I decided I need to go back and learn how to teach. But I remember walking into your band room and your Midwest band started on concert A flat and played all the way around the circle. Yeah, so, that was in the days where I thought playing all 12 major scales were. Right. Were, yeah. But I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave that here. Um, so you, you have switched jobs a number of times. And I know that your expectations are, are crazy. And I also know that you can teach those expectations. So when you walk into a, to a band program that, that is not meeting those expectations, so this is the other part of the question. And, and kids um, just have minimal... Um, uh, ability to do what you want to do besides getting overwhelmed which a lot of people do like oh my gosh where do I start where do you start how do, how do you approach this you know you've got three grade levels that aren't where you need them to be you know that your beginners will be your kids mm -hmm. so you know your seventh and eighth graders how do you approach that where do you start for me everything starts with a long tone I mean if you can't make the most beautiful sound on that instrument and in the way I start my particular program regard I'm a clarinetist but you know I might have a trumpet in my hand and I may I may play a concert F for eight counts and then I have them imitate it and then we just go back and forth and and we go back and forth until I like the sound and they understand that and and they to 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 kind of focus that to the center of the bullseye if you will and and I also think it's important to to find success in that and find excitement in the fact that they just did it and because a lot of times I would do that and I would say did you hear that did you hear the center of that sound and some of the kids would be like and some of them be like you know it's like it, it well let's try it again so you hear it here's what you're going to listen for and 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 get them listening and and middle school kids and Chip will attest to this too middle school kids can play in tune if we teach them how to you know, you get your three kids playing a playing a G on on clarinet and have the 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 middle one pulled out a lot, so it's like really really sharp. And then then pull it, you know, make them listen and adjust. 
you know, it's what we teach is what they can do, you know, and, um, and, and it's, it's just the expectations. You, do you want to lower your expect, expectations to where they are? Mm, maybe a little, but you don't lose where your expectations are going to take them. You don't want your expectations to be so high that they can't, they can't come to it. If, it, if my expectations going in are way up here, down here, they're not going to make that all of a sudden. So maybe a li little steps and then keep, make sure you're like three steps ahead of them the whole way. And, and pretty soon it's like Chip said, they, they're playing better and they don't even realize it's happening. And they're already up to grade three, grade four music because of that. Yep. Yeah. Our, our job is to take them where they are and bring mm -hmm. them as far as we possibly can by the end of the year. And that doesn't matter if we're teaching fifth graders. It doesn't matter if we're teaching college kids. It doesn't matter if it's our first year of teaching. It doesn't matter if our 25th year of teaching. Our job is to, to take that group of kids that's in front of us and bring them from where they are, not where we wish they were, but where they are and bring them to where to where they can possibly be. Um, and I think that mindset is, is really important. And I, I, there's, you're never going to be happy with how the band sounds. It's, it's a miserable, in a lot of ways, it's kind of a miserable career in that way. It's just, you're never ever happy. And if you, if you get the kids playing at another tier, there's the next tier, there's the other program you hear, it's the band you hear at the state convention, it's the band you hear at Midwest. It's like, man, I want my band to sound like that. And it's never, ever, ever, ever enough. Um, and so it's always just taking them where they are and getting them as far as you can. Um, and I, I, I realize that <clears throat> the person asking the question um, th doesn't want the answer of you just know in terms of how to pick the repertoire. But I, I think the reason you get that answer a lot is because it's the truth. And as, as, a, younger, as a younger teacher, you don't, you don't hit less bullseyes as a more experienced teacher. The more experienced teacher just has to throw fewer darts to hit that bullseye. So if you pick a piece that makes the kids cry, you know, you're not going to pick that piece again the next time around. And it's just, it's just that experience that, that helps you, that helps you learn. Um, but well, I'm I, calling on colleagues, you know, yeah. getting and help. Repertoire list that you trust mm -hmm. um, from, from teachers that you trust and just picking off that list. Um, and I think also making sure that you have a variety of difficulty levels in the folder um, so that you, you have stuff that they can play straight down and you can work on things other than notes and rhythms. Because I'm trying to think what's going to make a kid cry. I like physically cry from pain would be maybe some range stuff or technique that they just can't play because it's too hard. Um, and they emotionally can't handle that fact that they can't do it. Um, but other, other than that, I mean, I, I've, never, I've never had a kid cry because we were working on balance or had a kid cry because we were working on pitch or tone or, or anything like that. Yeah, so we've got about 10 minutes left and I, I wanna get to four more questions. So I'm gonna speed up just a little bit. Um, those of you in here that teach middle school band will appreciate this question. Remember this question is coming from a student who's getting ready to graduate. Um, so their question is in beginning band, how do you stay sane? And then it goes on to say, I did my internship um, with middle schoolers and thought I was going to go crazy with the kids. Would you say it takes a, a certain type of person to stick with middle schoolers or that you get used to them or, you know, it, you both, it takes a really special person to teach middle school. So, <laughs> so talk about that. I think teaching middle school has uh, kept me grounded. I love it. I, I, I love the age level kids. And I, I think it's, I think it's, it comes back to the enthusiasm. It, you got to make it fun. It's got to be fun. And yes, it's, it's got to be, uh, they've got to make progress, but you've got to make getting there fun. And, and I, it does take a special kind of person. I mean, it, I've said often that, I, I taught orchestra for like four years of my career, nothing but orchestra. And I, I said, that was the time that I had the most respect for middle school orchestral teachers, because you can teach beginning strings, you can teach high school strings, but the middle school is where the teaching really takes place. And then I got thinking, well, that's the same thing for band. I mean, it really is. When you can do, you know, what's, what's super fun is be doing an honor band and, and I'm up playing clarinet or trumpet and demonstrating something. 
and then the trombones are sucking at what they're doing. And I, I, I take my trombone mouthpiece out of my pocket and I go back and I go to the kid and I say, can I use your trombone a minute? And they just kind of look at me. So I take my mouthpiece, put it in and, and, and say, no, I really want you to play it like this. And they go, oh, okay. So that's pretty cool. Now, I don't think we're going to be able to do that in the, in the recent future, in the near future. But anyway, I think it's just about staying excited. You know, some people aren't made for middle school and maybe high school. Would be, but I think it depends on the person and you've got to figure that out. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if there's a certain type of person who's better fit for middle school. I think what's important is that you have to be yourself. And, and if, you're, if you're trying to be somebody that's not you, if you're trying to be your cooperating teacher, or, you know, my, my favorite middle school band director right now is Robert Herrings at Henry Middle School in Leander, Texas. But we teach, we teach almost nothing alike. Our, our styles are almost completely different. Um, and he's got to be him. And if I were to try to do what he does, it wouldn't work. I've got to do it. I've got to do things the way that I do it. Um, and I think staying true to yourself, besides the fact that kids recognize when you're not being your, yourself um, and they can see right through it, I think being true to yourself mm -hmm. is, is really important. Awesome. So the next question, you know, when I was having three, 350 kids in my middle school band program, just to get a grade in the computer sometimes took an act of God. I mean, it's, it's overwhelming sometimes. So this question from the student is, um, how has your grading changed over the years and if it has what caused it to change i think one of the things we're not great at as band directors is is we we assess constantly in rehearsal our pen to paper uh written assessment or getting grades in the grading book we we are not particularly great at great at so can you both um talk about that a little bit hmm. uh, well, I, oh go ahead no well, I was going to say, I didn't even, I didn't even have to give grades for the longest time. I think I had to start, the district asked me to start giving grades probably five or six years ago. Um, for the, so, so for the first 19, 20 years of my career, I didn't, they, the band wasn't even on the report card. Um, and they didn't, they didn't get grades. And then from there, we switched to pass fail. Um, and it was, it was strictly a way because of the way the teacher retirement system in Illinois structured their reports. And the district was worried that if, uh, if they didn't report any grades from my classes to the state, that it would affect my teacher retirement. So they, yeah. they asked me to start giving grades. Um, and so we just did pass fail for the longest time. Um, and, uh, and now we use standards based grading, which is, which is kind of a uh, extends meets uh, approaching to the grade. I hate it. I really hate giving grades. Um, for the same reason, Jim, that you did, it takes a lot of time they're not really necessarily reflective of the student's progress, um, which is I think probably why we don't invest the time in them is because we know they don't really have as much meaning. Um, you know, what is what does an A in band mean? For, for a lot of us, it just means a kid's given the effort that we're looking for. It's, mm -hmm. it's not necessarily an indication of where they are performance level wise. Sure, Teresa? Yeah, I think I still, you know, I still go back to the, the, I play a lot in class, so I still go back to the practice cards, and I know people, that's a double-edged sword. People say, why, why do them? Because the kids just lie. But you know what? There's always those kids that don't, and that's why I do it. There are going to be kids that, that get better because they're doing the right thing. And so, you know, the practice cards give me a, a way to do that, and chances are the kids that don't turn in the practice cards are the ones that aren't doing very well anyway. So, you know, when you give grades for that, that that helped me out and it, it motivates the kids that want to work. Sure. Next question. Um, one of the things that I talk to our students here about a lot is classroom procedures and taking the time to talk about procedures in the beginning of the year. Um, this question from this student is what are some daily procedures that you have your students follow that make the band room more efficient? And this is more of a management sort of crowd control maybe question, but Talk to us a little bit about just some general procedures or even specific ones that you use that just make the band room function better. Okay, well for me the first the first thing I do in sixth grade band when I have them in a full ensemble, uh, whether it's just brass and woodwinds, whatever it is, a larger group is that we actually, we don't, we don't talk about the procedures, we do the procedures. So the first day they'll come into my class, their names will be uh, I, I let them sit anywhere they want the first day, and then we go back out, 
and uh, we practice coming into the room. Where do they put their backpacks? Where do they put their books? When do they get their instrument? Where is their instrument? Where does it go? Uh, every, every, every instrument has a place in the room and that's, that's where it goes. They know exactly if it's a clarinet or flute, they can put the case underneath the chair. Uh, the tubas have to go back into the, to the cages. And uh, so we actually rehearse all of that. And then uh, eventually, um, you know, I, or the second day, I may have them just sit alphabetical. Say, I like my clarinets here, my flutes here, blah, blah, blah. And I actually let them get in alphabetical order themselves with minimal amount of talking and to see how quickly they can do it. And then they have, that also helps me learn their names quickly as well. So I think it's more about, more about rehearsing it and I'll re-rehearse re it after a break. You know, sure. after, after, after a fall break or a Christmas break, we'll come right back and we'll, we'll go through those procedures again. And a well-prepared teacher will have minimal classroom disruptions. Sure, Chip? Yeah, I'm, I'm right on board with that. And the, whatever those procedures are, and they can really be anything that you're unhappy with how they're behaving, um, you can develop a procedure for. Um, but it's, it's a skill and, and like any skill, it can be taught, it can be practiced and it can be improved upon. Um, the ones that I see myself going, going back to all the time is how are we gonna start rehearsal um, in terms of what is the, the, the routine gonna look like at the very beginning? How do we change music? Like what mm -hmm. we practice changing pieces. We finish a piece, going to the next piece. How do we, how do, we do that? Um, how do we stop? Like if we're, if we're rehearsing something and I cut the band off, how do we stop? You know, do I cut off and they play for eight more measures or do I cut off and they stop immediately? I give my instruction and we start again. We literally practice it. I, mm -hmm. I, I give them the expectation of what we're looking for. And I say, let's practice that. And we, we go through the routine and we'll just do it a few times. Right. Um, and whenever, whenever they don't follow the procedure, just like if they were to miss a note or they're having mm -hmm. trouble with the fingering, we go back and we practice it. Um, and that's, that's way more effective than yelling at them. And I've tried, I've tried both and, and I found the, the, the practicing the procedures works and has a much longer, long lasting effect. Sure. Dr. B, I mean, we're at an hour and I want to give these, these two guys a chance to add anything else they might want to add or speak of that I didn't ask. But do we have any questions from anyone? Um, I know we're up to 54 participants and um, anyone that wants to ask something now would be the time. Well, even if you want to ask, even if you want to ask some something later, um, my my email is really easy to find. I'm sure Teresa's is really easy to find. And if the worst case, you can reach us through Jim. Yeah, but and if you and, want and, something to ask later. Sure, and we can put your email addresses in the chat here too, so they can they can yeah. uh, email you if they want. Um, uh, Ralph Brody asked, what other text do you use for ensemble techniques? So can you talk really briefly, um, just tell us what your preferred method is for beginners through eighth grade and just give us a quick snapshot of what you've used and like or any supplements that you like? Uh, for, for me, I don't know if it really matters. I kind of think they're all the same, but we use um, the books that we do use. We use uh, Standards of Excellence. We use Musical Mastery. We use teaching rhythm logically. We use those three texts pretty exclusively for their first couple, two, three years of instruction. Um, and we use uh, a book, I'm gonna go ahead and just plug one of my books. It's called Carouse and Beyond. It's published by FJH. I co-wrote it with Timothy Lost. Um, it's, uh, it's our warm up. it's our daily routine that I've used with McCracken for the last 20 years. Um, and uh, we, we made Midwest using the book. I'll, I'll sell it in that way. It's something we use every single day. And Chip, I'll say too, I've, I've used those corrals with my middle school band that, that you did, and, and it just allows me to teach. You can teach so much through corrals and, and just having kids play through, and, and they're well thought out and well written for middle school kids, and they're great. So yeah. those of you in the room, if you haven't checked them out, check them out. Teresa? Uh, I, I'm still a proponent of, for eighth grade or maybe even ninth grade, if depending on the situation, of the Strictly Technique book because it's so, uh, it's so little, and it's, and it, Every page is laid out the same thing. Uh, one page is all a scalar uh, exercises, and the next thing you can actually practice sight reading. And then every uh, there's some rhythmic things there, and then the, there's two corrals and a major and minor. Great warm up for for uh, an upper level 
like eighth grade band. For the younger groups, I'm still, you know, with my fifth graders, I would start in, in whatever method book I wanted because they're, they're a lot, they're all the same. And sometimes I just switch them up because I wanted something different. And then they would do something different. They would get a new book in sixth grade, but it would still be another new book at a beginning level. So we would go, they'd come into sixth grade and because they're playing every day, they'd go faster and faster through it. So that gave them a sense of accomplishment. So there's a, there's a great book too. Uh, I think it's called Artistries and Fundamentals by Frank Erickson. That is absolutely wonderful. It's a little on the harder side though, but uh, those Well, she froze it. There you are. You're back. You froze up for a second. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, Teresa. That um, for everyone in the room, that strictly technique book. It's like five bucks. Teresa and I used that for years, and uh, it's it's a purplish pink. I think it's got purple letters and a pink background by Jim. And, and it really great. goes through, doesn't it? Like uh, five flats and maybe three sharps or yeah. something. Yep. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Any well, other questions? If if you could. Uh, we're going to be on this meeting for the next hour with Dr. Gilgrazia. Uh, Chip, Teresa, if, if you could pop a link to some of those ref, uh, resources in the chat, that'd be terrific. Chip, please, please link your text in the chat. And Teresa, Jim, anything that you just mentioned there, I'm sure the folks would find it convenient to have a little button to, uh, to go find some of that terrific stuff. Okay. Teresa, Chip, you want to close close out with anything? We're a little over time. Any any parting thoughts? I, I want thanks thanks for everybody for sticking with it for the hour. You know, my 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 biggest thing to say is if if you can teach it, they can do it. And, and if you're if you're not feeling like you want to teach it, then go listen to something great and, and go go to something to get you get yourself um, energized again. Because if you lose the energy, you'll lose the kids. Thank you, Teresa. And I guess I don't really have anything to add to that. Otherwise, just to thank, thank for thank you for the invitation. And uh, this is just a really cool thing that you guys are continuing to do throughout the course of the summer to support the teachers in Arkansas. It's really great. Uh, what's what's really cool is is 53 educators in the middle of all this mess that we're in, still taking the time on on a July evening to try to get better. And and amazing the the two of you, Teresa and Chip, to give of yourselves. You know, we, we had a, in a previous one of these sessions a few weeks ago, I said that there, every band director I've ever met is willing to help. And uh, unfortunately, one of the participants said that she'd had a terrible experience with band directors who just told her, I don't care about you. Don't, I'm not going to help you at all. And I, that, that, that seems so out of the ordinary. And, and every Tuesday night this summer, it's been refreshing and, and fulfilling for me to see everybody and, and have folks with your experience come and, and, and give us what you can here is is just such a big part of that. So thank you so much, Chip and Teresa and, and, and everybody that's here. It's, it's inspiring uh, as, as usual that our directors are, are here trying to get better, even though we all don't know what band's even gonna look like in the next little while. Hey, yeah, good luck. <laughs> You're retired, it doesn't matter, right? No, right, absolutely. Yeah, we all got that. We all understood what, what Teresa meant right there. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of my recently retired friends go, yeah, good luck with that. Yeah, have, have, have fun. So uh, thanks again, Chip, Teresa, Jim, anything else or? Nope, that's it. I, I put a link to the Strictly Technique and I know Chip put a link, but, but anything that you all need, feel free to, we'll, we'll get it to you.